hi, everyone. Welcome back to another session on catching up with our past Shin Shinim. You all know me. I'm Jared Grover. I'm the rabbi. And I'm pleased today to be joined live from Israel, where it is 10 o'clock at night. But I'm very grateful to Omri Negri for agreeing to have this conversation with us, even in the late hours of the evening. I don't think he's doing much, right? You're free. Yeah, pretty much, you know. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, it's locked down there too, so not much going on. Um, have this conversation and update us about his life, about life in Israel. Help us feel a little bit more connected to Israel in a, in a year where it's uh, the connection, the disconnection has probably never felt so strong. So Omri yeah. was our Shin Shin in 2013, 2014, and he was at Beth Tikva. Where else were you at? So uh, we also worked in um, Heschel Day School. Right. And the JCC up north, the Schwartz Riesman JCC. Right. You were doing some stuff with their with um, the leadership program there, right? Yes. Yeah, so we had a program with the leadership program and also with the Sunday school that they, um, I, I don't know if they still have, but at least had yes. back yeah. then. Kachol Lavan, right? Yes, Kachol Lavan, exactly. Okay. So, uh, Omri, tell us, Begadol, in general, what have you been doing since... Catch us up since, <laughs> since 2014. I know it's a long time, but a lot of <laughs> us haven't spoken to you since then. So tell us what yeah. you've been busy with. So ever since. So I got drafted to the um, IDF back in 2014. I served in combat in a battalion called Karakal, which is a... Um, a joint battalion of um, men and women in infantry. So um, the role of this battalion is to keep the southern border, the Egyptian border. Um, so I did that <laughs> very briefly for three years. So your job was guarding the Egyptian border. Yes. Yeah, so everything from the from the point where Gaza and Egypt meets all the way to uh, halfway to a, to Elat, something around that. Ah, that whole border was yours. And I think we I once visited a base near there. So surveillance, right, is a huge part of yes. what that means guarding the border. Excuse me, I couldn't hear you. What? Surveillance is a huge part of guarding the border, right? Yes, for sure. I mean, there's there was a, a lot, lot of uh, night vision and motion yes, cameras. And, and, and anyone touches something, you're there in two minutes. Right. So we have a lot of cameras that go that runs all, all across the border. And... As you said, it's a night vision and they can see. I don't remember exactly how much, how far they can see, but like really far, like dozens of kilometers into Egypt. So they can notify us if they see something, you know, that is coming. They can tell us approximately how long it will take them to to reach the border. Um, yeah, and it's... <laughs> A bit complicated to explain, but it, it does have a lot of, um, of of cameras and understanding what's going on on the other side and reacting to it. Right. Right. And I remember there was a documentary on on uh, TV that I was watching in Hebrew about Arayota Yarden, which is yeah. one of the other co-ed infantry units in the. Are they like you guys? You know them, Arayota Yarden, because it yeah, was very in, serving in a co-ed unit is is very unique, right? Yes, there are only so when I got drafted, we were the only unit that was a co-ed wow. unit. Wow! And they opened Arayota Yarden, as you mentioned, then a couple of more. I can't remember their names. So now I think that they have four, maybe. 
five, but it's very specific and we do know them. We don't interact with them a lot. It's pretty uh, distant, I would say. You know, everyone has their own border and we do mix up the border sometimes, but basically everyone does their own. But whenever we have, um, you know, seminars or I, I was also a commander. So we had a commander's course. So um, it was joint, all of these, um units together as well as all the regular infantry units and, and when i was watching that show a lot of the soldiers were not happy that they were in a, a co-ed unit was were you happy that you were drafted into a unit like that a lot of the guys felt like oh i should be in a elite combat unit not right. with these girls and <laughs> a lot of the girls felt the same way like what am i with these boys for i want to be doing the things that female soldiers traditionally have done in the army. I want to have the same experience that my mother had or my sister. Had. Right. So it's a very complicated situation. So basically I think that there are many units in the army that suffer from, um, from this situation where many people are drafted because we don't have a choice where we go. The, the army tells us where we have to go. That's right. So, obviously everyone wants to go to the 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 elite of the elite units or the the most special one and so most people will say i will i would rather go to the elite of the elite or to something that i where i don't have to work as hard like the the very edges um so it is a problem and then I think that it's all a matter of perspective because like at the end, Golani, they're also patrolling a border. So it's the Gaza border or it's Shrem, whatever it is. But at the end of the day, they're keeping civilians safe just like I do. So maybe they'll have, you know, some more action um, throughout their service. Um, unlike me, which was a lot of desert right. but at the end of the day everything is important i mean keeping the border everything safe is important. you got lucky that it was a lot of desert but it could have been true you have to be ready for anything exactly and you know sometimes things happen and you have to be prepared for anything um and you know sometimes it's even harder i don't know if harder but um when, when you have stuff happening every day you are always prepared but when you have something happen only once every two months it's really hard to keep yourself ready for the next thing that is going to happen right. um so again it's three years i had my highs i had my lows it wasn't but you were a groundbreaking kind of troop right sort of i would say one of I mean, the only co-ed infantry troops at yes. the time in the army and that was a whole new experiment did right beth Tick, did serving as a shin shin at beth tikva with a female <laughs> partner help <laughs> prepare me for the day that prepare i prepare you right for some of the struggles 100 percent. the cold the, the cold prepared me a little bit yeah the cold right in this show about in which was very similar on Israeli TV, Arayota Yarden, mm -hmm. they talked about how cold it gets on those desert nights. And I forgot, yes. uh, you don't think of Israel as a place with a cold climate, but the desert at night can be just like Toronto in the winter. So, it's except you don't have a winter thing. jacket, you don't have the clothes. Exactly. So, right. It never gets to like, I don't know what, minus 15 in Israel. It would be the, at the minimum, maybe negative two degrees. Right. But when you are in, in uniforms and you have to have your gear on, you can't have, you know, your winter coat and your hat and, and mittens and whatever. You have right. to be prepared. You have to hold your, your gun and you have to be, you know, have the ability to, to, to use it. And the gear doesn't go on all of these coats. So you, you just have to be, um, you know, just freeze and then, just, you know, go through. So that's literally a low. <laughs> you talked about <laughs> your eyes and this is the low. Those nights in oh, the desert. Yes. Yeah. 
from so three. So th that was for three years. And then what? And after that, your freedom. I, yes. I moved to Jerusalem and I worked as a youth co a counselor in um, Modi'in, which is like 20 minutes north-ish of Jerusalem. Help us understand what that means. What does that mean, nor youth sure. counselor? Sure. So um, and I think that in Israel, youth movement is something that is very different than in Canada. Right. Um, so here, a youth movement is something that is very integral in a kid's life. So they will have activities in um, in uh, wherever the activity is being held um, twice or even three times a week. They'll have their own group, which is a close group of between seven and 15 kids that are around their age and they'll have activities. So um, the, the thing about youth movement in Israel that high schoolers are um, are doing activities for um, fourth graders, four to sixth right. grade, and, and then you know seventh grade will have a counselor that is from twelfth grade, whatever. So my role was to supervise all the activity and one specific location in Modi'in. We had three locations, so one of them I was in charge of. Um, so it's everything. And which youth from... group was this? Was this the youth group that you were a member of? I forget. Was it Young Judea for you? No. So it was um, Hanor Oved, which is um, oh. the sister of Habonim Dror. Okay. Yeah. So it it was the same one. Yes. So after the army, you spent a year. Two years. Being in a, two years in a supervisory role. Yes. For the Hanoar HaOved, and right. how was that? How uh... Hard, <laughs> it was very hard. Harder um, than the, the year you spent with us? Yes, undoubtedly. Really? Yes. yes I, thought we, I thought we drove you to exhaustion, so there's worse. <laughs> it was pretty exhausting, but <laughs> it's just that when you have it's because this is more recent so you don't remember us maybe as, as, maybe so as well <laughs> but i think that there's also something when interacting with parents in toronto they are probably more polite and nicer ah, in israel if ah, the parents ah, are angry ah. they're full-fledged angry ah, so right so you're like the school part. principal in many ways and exactly. you have to learn how to deal with the parents when they're upset about something that happens with their kids. And yes. an angry Israeli mother is, is no <laughs> match easy. for her, right? Yes, no match. So even after three years in the army and seeing all of Israel's enemies, it was what took you down were the Israeli mothers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I would. That's when you finally face... were defeated. I would face the the Egyptian posts every day and not return to, to that. <laughs> not role. return to that. Okay. So yeah. then after to after those two years, where are we now? We're at 2018? We're 2018, yes. Okay. Um, and give us an update. But, what was next in your life? So after that, I took a whole um <laughs> I had a big shift. I started working at a um, high tech company, I started to do marketing. And I did that for two years. And now I'm studying in Hebrew U in Jerusalem. So you're you're how old now? I'm 26. It's so different. So we start we go to university at 18. Right. I mean, 17. I mean, and it, you're it, 26 I, and just starting at Hebrew U. It's so interesting. Right. I, I, it's it's worth mentioning that I'm older than most people that start university. Most but people, you're, but you're not that 24. unusual, right? No, but, no. but it's not that unusual for somebody no, no. six to be starting their undergraduate year. Yes, yes. It's the I'm like the the older normal. Like no right. one would would be would look at me and say, "Whoa, what are you doing?" Like it, it's the normal. It's just a bit older. Yeah. And where are you living on campus or at home? So I live 
Um, I rent the house in Jerusalem. I don't live in campus and I don't live um, with my parents or anything. And are you liking Hebrew? You are you liking living in Jerusalem? It's become. So, Go ahead. I love Jerusalem. It's by far Remind my us favorite where you're city. from. You're not from Jerusalem. No, originally I'm from Pardesia, which is a small moshav right. near Netanya. Yes. Um, so I love Jerusalem so much. It's probably my favorite what is city. It? Tell me what is it about Jerusalem? It's a very controversial city in, uh, it is. in Israel. I don't know if you noticed. People have I, strong I have. feelings. <laughs> I have noticed. So I think that it's, it's two things. So first of all, I think that it's a city in all the best ways. And also, it doesn't feel that much of a city. When you walk in Tel Aviv, it feels like you're in downtown Toronto. It's like a, a real city, a big city. And Jerusalem, while it doesn't have the same feeling, although we, it does have, you know, skyscrapers, uh, somewhat of sky, skyscrapers, um, it is more, it feels, it's quieter. It, it has more, you know, parks and green areas and places where you can hike. And so on, on one hand, you, you have your space. And on the other hand, it's still a city. So you can still, you know, go to the city center and go out and you can still, you know, get from one place to another in a bus, which is not that trivial in most places in Israel. Actually. Yes. Um, I agree so with it, you, by the way. I'm also a big, big fan of Jerusalem over, uh, over the, the Merkaz. Yes, 100%. But I also, I think that Jerusalem has something, I can't really explain it. I, I, I think that you will agree with me that there's something in the atmosphere here, something that just, it's just different. I, I can't explain it, but there's Don't something. Don't tell me you're becoming religious now, Omri. Wow. Not really. I can hear it a little bit. <laughs> I'm very something. excited Maybe about Maybe something in comes from God. Maybe so. You know, the closest new to the Western Wall and everything. You're in a holy city. That's true. It's true. So what part of Jerusalem do you live in? A lot of us know Jerusalem at Beth Tikva. So I live in Rechavia. It's near the center of the city. We've heard of Rechavia, of course. Yeah. Beautiful. And, <laughs> and, you, and is school online now? Or do you it is. go on campus? Okay, so everything is through. And has it been that way from the start of the year? Yes. The, wow. At the beginning of the year, they were optimistic that at some point we'll start returning to, you know, to the actual campus, but that hasn't happened yet. Seems very far away right now. Yeah. And what are you studying? So I'm studying um, Hebrew studies and Japanese studies. In Hebrew, you, you have to take two majors. And you picked Hebrew and yes. Japanese. So help us understand why you chose Hebrew, given that you already know Hebrew. So language, so Hebrew, specifically language studies. Yes, so language studies. So origins of the Hebrew language. Yes, so it's it's studying all of its history. So from the, the consumption of Hebrew back in, I don't know, 1000 BC to to this day, you know, all of its features, who spoke it, how, where, um, and you know, everything today, grammar to um, vocabulary, whatever it is. Right. So actually, this is the more unique one, I would say, overall, we are maybe 20 people that are studying Hebrew. Wow. In Hebrew U. And it, it is considered a, a, a larger class. I mean, usually it's more around 12. Um, I, there's something that excite, that gets me excited about language. So I really li love reading books. And there's something about understanding what makes me excited about reading books. What makes, when I read a good book, what exactly makes me feel the way I feel? And I feel like that literature doesn't give me the exact thing I want to know. I want to understand what 
in the words make me feel? Why do I feel the way I feel when I hear language? So this is why I chose Hebrew. And Japanese? And Japanese, which is more common, you'd be surprised, than Hebrew. There are more students at Hebrew U studying Japanese than there are studying Hebrew? Yes, much more. We are about 40 that are studying Japanese and 20 that are studying Hebrew. Wow. Yes. Um, so Japanese, I'm just, I got into it again from books. So my favorite author is a Japanese author um, named Haruki Murakami. Um, he's just an author and I, one time someone gave me his book, one of his books as a present and I started reading and it was amazing. And I read all of his, not all of, but most of his books. And through that, I got into, you know, Japanese culture, Japanese history, um, pretty much that way. So is there anything you want to do with that degree specifically? Do you want to move to Japan? Do you want to Continue. I do not want to move have to you, Japan. You don't want to move to Japan. Have you visited Japan? I I plan to visit Japan, but okay. then we got hit by the virus. But I had plans to visiting before, but just didn't get the chance. Um, and and tell me, so so you, how many years is it to get that degree? This is your first year. Yes, this is my first year. It's three years. Three years. And we'll see where life takes you after that degree. Are you Probably. happy? Are you doing well? Yes. It's been a hard time, hasn't it? So tell yeah, us it's... a bit about how pandemic land has changed life in yes. Israel. Well, it's very, it's not easy. No I more tourists that... clogging up yes. the streets of Jerusalem. That must be nice. <laughs> I don't know. Cause uh, with no tourists, we also have everything closed. So right. you have really no reasons to walk in the streets of Jerusalem. Make sure you tell your friends, keep those restaurants open. If I go back there and all the places are closed, I'll be so sad. <laughs> we all feel this way. We are all waiting yeah. for the moment where we can go back to a proper restaurant in Jerusalem and have <laughs> whatever. Right. R really anything. So I think that, you know, at the core, every one of us, I mean, probably you two feel the same about the lockdowns and everything. Um, so which is what? Angry, angry, depressing, lonely. Depressing. Yeah. Um, it has been really hard. Um, I already I already had to quarantine twice because I either, you know, um, met someone who had um, who was positive for the virus or I was maybe around someone. So in Israel, they will, they track everyone and they can tell you, you were near someone on this date at this location. How do they, show. how do they track everyone? With their phones, I guess. I don't know. So someone, so the government is using your phone to track who, where, who, uh, where you are and who you were around. So I'm and they called sure. you and said, you were they, around they texted somebody? Me. Texted. Really? And said, yeah. even Canada, you have to download an app for that so, to happen. I think that in Israel, we have two things. So uh, I'm not 100% sure if they, you know, locate your phone or whatever they do. I know that they will rigorously um, question a person that is positive with the virus and they'll ask him right where have you been every i don't know every place you've been in the past x amount of time right and contact that, tracing and yes, actually exactly. we just spoke to uh some shinshinim who are still in the army and they mm -hmm. said that's part of the job that the army tries to do they help really? with contact tracing so that every time there's a positive case, they can get to that web of contacts. Right, it makes I think sense. In that's... Canada, we've given up on that already. There's so many cases. Well, th that's someone the contacted you and army, said, "Yes, exactly." They said exactly. cheap labor. <laughs> well, you need a. I, I get. I can't imagine how many people you have to have working on. You know, 
tracing every single person that was absolutely that is sick and it's probably crazy yeah so you were contacted twice and yes. told to go into isolation be dude mm -hmm. yes be dude right and so you had the same feelings of frustration as everyone has with these periods of isolation it's been hard on you it's, uh, can't see your family can't see your friends right so now i think that we are going in a positive direction because of yes. the vaccines that is being spread really unbelievably fast right like my parents already have uh, got it both shots my grandparents already got both shots everyone wow it's really fast here so um yeah i actually haven't seen my grandparents i haven't seen in probably six months i don't know can't remember and now you could go see them yes and now i can go see them <laughs> currently we are in lockdown so can't but in a couple oh. of weeks i'll probably will and why is israel in lockdown now because we have a, a third wave everything is going crazy here there's another wave even with all the vaccines yes right now it doesn't like the vaccine is still not um really we we don't see the effect of it I think they they said that only above a certain percentage that we didn't hit yet. And I think that another thing is that the communities that are the least, you know, listening to protocols are the, the also the communities that least get vaccinated uh, at the same time. Right. So they are still getting sick. And all of Israel is in lockdown because there are different communities in Israel that are not um, taking yes. the vaccine. You're speaking specifically about Haredim and about Palestinians? Yes. Okay. Um, there, so there are more communities, but I would say that, you know, they're the biggest. Palestinians and Haredim are probably like 30, 35% of the population. So it's not, it's a, a very big community that we're talking about. Right. But you're starting to see, like many Israelis, the light at the end of the tunnel. There, yes. We there are better days have, coming. Yes. I know that people that are, are, that got vaccinated twice already, they'll have their green passport or whatever which means that they can already go into shops and stuff and they can also leave the country if they want, they like go overseas, but right now, probably not. That's right. Um, so we are going in a positive direction, I hope. Um, well, you mentioned your family, how are they all, how are they all doing? Give us an update about your family. Um, pretty good. My parents are, are doing, um are very they're both very well i mean well we're all very good none of them got laid off while everything was happening so they're all still working um you know none of them had to go through um anything that is too hard but i have two older brothers they both have children that are not going to kindergarten because mm. there isn't any so that is hard and you know when we started a few months ago when we weren't in lockdown my sister and i would come and we would help but now we can't come and help because uh. of lockdown so they have to take care of their kids all alone not leaving the house at all i'm sure that every parent that has you know a four year old year old can understand that yeah how hard it is well we suffer in toronto but toronto uh most people live in houses in Right. Israel, people tend to live in smaller uh, apartments and, and multifamily units. And so it's a lot smaller space to be together all the time. Yes, but I think that after spending two weeks with a, you know, two year old crying all the time, not going anywhere, you know, every, working from home, I feel like the space gets kind of smaller. It's even, even smaller. Right. Yeah. 
Yes, no even if you live in a mansion, it, 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 you know, the space right. ends. You can't point. put a crying kid in, in another wing of yes. the house, no matter how big exactly. it is. It, it'll, it'll still end up on your lap. <laughs> exactly. There's no running away from the, you know, crying and shouting. Tell us something you'd like us to know or appreciate about Israel. We don't have Shin Shinim this year. Tell That's us hard. something that uh, you'd like us to know about Israel this year, particularly this year, after what you're seeing in the country, that you think would help, help, help that would make us proud. So I do think, I think that the best thing that we learned during this pandemic is how good our um, healthcare system is. Um, okay. Tell us more about that. Yeah. Even though we have one of the highest rates of, of, infections of people getting infected with the d disease we have one of the lowest death rates mm. um because we have a free health care that covers all that it works great um and you know sometimes it's hard to appreciate it you know how healthcare system can be you want to order you know uh, you want to go to the doctor and you can't uh, the only appointment is in 10 days and it's annoying right right but still when people need help they get it when we needed to vaccinate we already vaccinated i i don't even know maybe a quarter of the population which is amazing yeah and it's all free you don't need to pay for anything not the vaccination not and you can also get tested free at any day at any time you can just walk down the street we have locations everywhere wow. so i think that it really um, you know, it gave us a new confidence in our health system, healthcare system, which was much needed. And you're saying in Israel, you could get tested anywhere. Yeah, you can, as long as you have, each of us have the Kupat Cholim card, which is, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So healthcare card. Yeah. Healthcare card. And you can, Take that with another identification card. You can walk down wherever you, we have a list. You can go wherever without an appointment, wait in line, get tested, go back home. And it's and a how quickly? So. how quickly do you get your results back? 24 hours, maximum. Wow, maximum. And it's getting- Yeah, you can get it in 12, the, but an email? Usually, usually 24. What is that? An email? <laughs> how do you find out what your results are? So if you are negative, they'll text you. And if you are positive, oh, excuse me, they text you. Wow. Yeah. Wow. You know, in some states in the United States, they're still mailing people the results. That's really incredible that in Israel, you get a text message, negative, yeah. positive. Wow. The Not surprised system here to hear. Works magnificent. Right. It sounds like a great partnership between startup nation, high tech Israel and, um, and healthcare. Exactly. Yes, 100%. I think that both um, the fact that we do have all the people with the ideas, all the technology that is available, but also I think that people just, most people just understand what is needed. I mean, people will go and get tested. People mostly will listen to protocol. Like, I don't know anyone that had to quarantine and went out of the house. It, it happens for sure. Yeah. But not not much, not a lot of the times. It's not a, a problem. You're saying people took the uh, uh, rules quite seriously in Israel. People weren't yes. looking for ways to bend them. If they thought there, there was a chance that they were infected, in order to protect others, they were serious about uh about isolating yes and you know it, it's it's been a long while so i think that as time um goes by people are getting tired of everything i mean it's the third lockdown people are getting tired yeah. of lockdowns right we still are locked down i mean i haven't left the house in, in like 10 days at wow. all wow um so 
it's fine and people are doing so what how do you get your do. in 10 days how do you get your food we order them online oh, really everything just comes delivery yeah wow. pretty much i literally haven't left the house in 10 days like at Poor all guy we also have nowhere to <laughs> to walk i mean that's true even if you could where are you going yeah, yeah. Uh, there's so nothing is that the rule in israel you are not is that the rule you are not allowed to leave your house during a lockdown you can go on a walk you can go on a walk or you, you can like do sports if you want as long as you're doing it alone and you can go on a walk if you're just you know for example uh parents with kids can go to the nearest park as long as 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 long as it's within one kilometer or, or two kilometers, something okay. okay, close to their house. So you can leave the house and go outside. Um, you know, if you want to breathe, breathe some air, but more than that, there's like literally everything is closed, but supermarkets and, you know, farms and stuff like that. Right. Right. So let me ask you something else. Let's look back now to your years as a, to your year as a Shin Shin. If you could talk to 17-year-old Omri, who's applying for this program, what would you say to him? You should do it. It's great. Would you say it's a waste of a year? It's a mistake. And why? Interesting. That's an interesting question. So first of all, I would 100% tell him to do it again. But probably, probably not for the same reasons that I, that I originally went it's it's interesting so i think that um originally i went because i wanted to grow as a person i wanted to um contribute wherever i can um you know i, I really um strongly believed in the idea that um, the Jewish nation is one nation and that we should straighten the connections between Israel and um, Jews outside of Israel. Mm -hmm. So these are the reasons uh, why I went. Also, obviously, there's a certain amount of prestige that comes with working for the... Um, I don't think that you see it from your side because it's in front of... Um, UJA, but for us, it's in front of the the Jewish um, the Jewish Agency for Israel. Exactly, the Jewish Agency for Israel. So when you come back and you say that you did something for a Jewish Agency for Israel, it's a big thing. Um, yes, of course. So I think that first of all, one hundred percent, I would do it again for the people I met. I know it's cliche, I know it's a bit cheesy, but. 100% I would not give up on my host families and um, the community that I um, that I met and um, really it, it really does feel like a place that I can really go back to I don't know because there is you came a back a couple of years ago I did I, I was came it, or back was it last visit. year yeah. It wasn't last year, it was two years ago. It was. It Maybe was Pesach two years ago. Of, of it was Pesach two years ago. Yeah. I visited my sister who lived in New York. And I I one hundred percent knew that if I'm coming to New York, I would stop by in Toronto and, and say hello to everyone. Um I'm stopping by. But there's a certain feeling where when you can go back to someplace, not just because you've been there before, but you you're coming back that is really something you know that's special a feeling that you know you're going home which is more complicated than that i would say but it, it does have this feeling and you know i'm um i, I, I'm I know what you're saying now. it's it's not so much that you're coming home but it's a home yes exactly coming back to a city that's not just that you're a tourist in you exactly feel, oh i'm comfortable here this is toronto this is a part of me this 100 percent. and so i'm engaged now and once i get married i know that i'm going to take my future You're wife engaged. To hold on where where was that why aren't you getting it's 45 minutes into this interview i you asked ask, you what's I new know. in your life 
Well, you wouldn't mention it. It's more important you tell me about oh, here. about Maybe Egyptian sense. surveillance on a tower than your future life with your partner. I don't know. How, how do you drop it in during a conversation? Omri, mazal tov. Thank you. That's wonderful. Bishat tova. So who's doing uh, who's doing your wedding? <laughs> we're so what I was about to tell you is that we're thinking after having a wedding in Israel, I want to take my my fiance future wife to Toronto to do something also for for my you know friends that I have there now. What you mean is you want to have another wedding in toronto <laughs> for your toronto friends with maybe a, a wedding that... it's, it's it's a big word but yes i do i want my uh, fiance to meet the people that are important to me um that i met during the the year i lived there and i want her to yeah. see the places that i've, I've you know as you said grown to to recognize as a home i mean so what's her name? Kama, K-A-M-A. -A. Kama. Yes. Mazal tov from all of us at Beth Tikva. It's, I think you are the first Shin Shin to get formally engaged. Makes sense. Oh, no, 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 you're not. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, no? Oh. No, 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 no. We had some get married already. Oh, I'm sorry, my brain isn't working. We'll edit this piece out. But <laughs> we're still happy for you. You may not be Thank the first. You. But... This is the first in your life, and we're very happy yes. for you. You might Thank be you. the first male. I think you might be the first male, mm. Shin Shin. You know, it takes the guys a little I'll bit take longer. It. Right. I'll it, take it. You might be the first male Shin Shin to have, uh, to have gotten <laughs> engaged. We're very happy for you, and I hope to, meet, to meet her one day. Yes, and, you will. And uh, we'll do your Canadian wedding. Yes. <laughs> Looking forward to it. So we spoke for 45 minutes. I could go on probably a lot longer. Yeah, it was so fun. interesting to hear about your life and about um, how Israel during this difficult, difficult time is proving its strength. Even for you, a cynical Israeli, you still <laughs> say, there are parts of Israel that make me feel very proud. Yeah. Um, the vaccinations, the healthcare system, and that's the Jewish way, right? There's nothing more important than people's 100%. health and, the, and taking care of them. So if we're going to contribute to the world and be a light to the nations in one area, people's health is, is really appropriate. Exactly. And I do think that also this year, I don't know what, this time um, really gives us a big question of how we want to treat the connection between you know jewish communities and israel when it is not possible to visit one another when you can't come here and yes. we can't send you know people there and we can't visit as well what does it mean to have the connection i think that it's a very important discussion that is really maybe overdue um, for for a while you're right. Uh, it's a few people who have said that, that some, somehow the Israel diaspora relationship um, can, uh, let me put it this way. It's too easy when you can fly back and forth. Exactly. I understand. Yes. Right. And yes, when we can't be in the country where it's really tested. Exactly. Uh, 100%. It's interesting. It takes extra effort, extra thought. Right. And also just in recognizing that, you know, it, it, it's something special that, that this connection, this, you know, nation, it's something unique. I'm just really into it because of my Hebrew studies. No, or, go ahead. You're, 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 this is about. what I like hearing. You're pulling on my heartstrings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep going. <laughs> so, Come on, Rabbi. <laughs> so it's something I think that is very, very unique. And in many ways, I don't think that anyone in the world can say that they belong to a nation that is this caring, even if the people never met, live in different countries, that they, you know, maybe 
have completely um, distinct tradition that they barely, well, we will all recognize the tradition, right? We all celebrate Pesach. We all, um, you know, have the high holidays and whatever we do. But still, there's something distinct. There's something unique with how the Jewish nation came to be to this day, I think, throughout all of the years from from the beginning, I guess, to today. And I think that we sometimes do need to stop and ask ourselves, are we satisfied with how things are going and what actions we need to take to improve, to, to get better maybe, to make it, you know, what do we envision for ourselves and how do we get there, I think. Maybe just Listen, some raw thoughts, Omri, if you would have come up and listened to my sermons once or in a while when you were in Beth Sifra, <laughs> I could have given you that same message years ago. Why'd you wait till now to figure it out? Uh, just, wait till you're at Hebrew, you till you're ready. You have to be ready exactly. to hear it. Uh, so uh, I'm to, happy to you finally arrived in your life to a stage where you're ready <laughs> to hear the message. I want to, exactly. I want, I want that to be the last word. I think you just said something very, very profound. Being Jewish, I always felt, and I hope others feel, is the greatest privilege. You're connected to a people with the most glorious history. Right, and 100%. To people all around the world who share a bond that is difficult to put into, that is difficult to put into words. And it's a privilege to be a part of something like that in a world where, where there's, there is so much loneliness. Uh, to know that even in the midst of it, we're still connected to, to each other. So it's a great, great conversation. Thank you very much, Omri, for giving us your time. I know you had absolutely nothing better to do, but I'm still grateful that you gave us the time to have this interview. And I wish you, uh, first of all, mazel tov on your engagement. Uh, when you come to Thank Toronto, let's much. have a party for you both, okay? I want to say arigato for all of the... <laughs> for all of the honesty in this conversation and from all of us in Toronto I'm so happy to hear that you feel like we're a home for you because the feelings are mutual we really feel that you're a part yes. of our home and uh, uh, wish you only strength and Hatzlacha uh, and that the light that's at the end of the tunnel should be upon you and upon all of us very very yes. soon hopefully Hopefully. Thank you very much. Thank you.